April 1922, Germany. In the small town of Hinterkaifeck, Bavaria, lay an isolated farmstead owned by the Gruber family. The family included 63-year-old Andreas, his 72-year-old wife Kazelia, their 35-year-old daughter Victoria Gabriel, and her two children, 7-year-old Kazelia and 2-year-old Joseph. They also had a maid, 44-year-old Maria Baumgartner. The family had not been seen in days. Young Kazelia had not shown up for school. The family, religious, had not attended church on Sunday. Host went uncollected. Concerned for the family, a neighbor called Lawrence Schlittenbauer visited the property along with two others. They arrived to find the farm quiet and seemingly abandoned. Then they looked inside the family barn and discovered four bodies belonging to Andreas and Kazelia Gruber, as well as Victoria and Kazelia Gabriel. The bodies of the maid, Maria, as well as Joseph Gruber, were found dead inside the homestead shortly afterwards. All six had been brutally struck in the head with a farming tool. The police were alerted and the investigation into one of Germany's most peculiar murders began. On the 31st of March 1922, Maria, the family's new maid, arrived on the farm. She had been escorted there by her sister, who left that same day. It is believed that she is the last person to see her sister and the family alive. That evening, the family were either drawn by noise or actively lured to the barn, where they were killed one by one. To kill them, the perpetrator or perpetrators likely used a mattock, a farming tool used for digging. Each family member was struck in the head. After killing four members of the family, the killer went to the homestead where, using the same mattock, they killed Joseph and Maria while they were sleeping. For four days, the bodies of the victims remained undiscovered while the killer lived in the homestead, eating the family's food and feeding the animals. On the 1st of April, the morning after the murders, Hans and Eduard Shikovsky arrived in Hinterkaifeck to arrange a coffee order. We knocked repeatedly on the windows of the house and also made noise, but no one heard. We then walked around the house and looked through the windows into the kitchen and stables, but could not see any person. Only the dog and the cattle made a sound. They found no one, but noticed that the gate to the machine house was left open. At this point, they left. People in the town became concerned when Cecilia Gabriel failed to show up to school, and when the family failed to show up for Sunday worship. On the 4th of April, Albert Hoffner, a local mechanic, arrived at the farm for a scheduled engine repair. When he arrived, the farm was quiet, save for the sounds of animals and a dog barking inside the barn. It is possible that the dog was trying to alert Albert to the location of the bodies. After waiting for some time, with no sign of the family, Albert proceeded with his repair before leaving roughly four hours later. That same day, at around 3.30pm, Lawrence Schlittenbauer, who was concerned about the family, sent his 16-year-old son, Johan, and nine-year-old stepson, Joseph, to the farm. When neither of the boys could find anyone, Lawrence decided to go to the farm himself, along with Michael Powell and Jacob Sigel. At first, they also found nothing. The farm was quiet and eerie. When they entered the barn, they finally discovered the bodies of Andreas Gruber, Cecilia Gruber, Victoria Gabriel and Kazelia Gabriel. When the bodies were found by Schlittenbauer, they were covered with hay and an old door was placed on top of them. The perpetrators probably got into the barn through the engine house. Shortly afterwards, Lawrence went into the homestead alone and discovered the bodies of Maria and Joseph. The initial investigation handled by George Reingruber, 
was an uphill battle from the start. Numerous individuals had interacted with the crime scene, and it was difficult to determine what was done by the killer, or if there was more than one killer involved. The victim's bodies had been moved, the murder weapon was missing, and it appeared someone had cooked and eaten in the kitchen post-murder. Johann Baptist Almuller conducted autopsies in the barn on the 5th of April. This was when he determined that a mattock was most likely used and would have been readily available on the farm. The murder weapon itself was not found until the farm was demolished a year later. A penknife was also found hidden in the hay in the barn during the demolition, although its involvement in the murders is undetermined. Evidence in the barn morbidly suggested that Cazelia Gabriel lived for several hours following the attack. She had torn out tufts of her own hair while writhing in the straw. The victim's skulls were sent to a forensics lab in Munich for further investigation. The skulls were later lost during World War II, so the family were buried without their heads. Robbery was considered as a possible motive, but this theory was dropped when it became clear that nothing of value was taken from the house and money was left untouched. It was evident that the killer had stayed at the farm for days following the murder. Meat had recently been cut from the pantry, and the kitchen oven had been used not long before the bodies were discovered. The killer had even been feeding the cattle and the family dog. Other investigative notes of interest include 1. One theory suggested that the victims were drawn to the barn by noise. However, it was determined that even human screams from the barn could not be heard from the homestead. As such, it is almost certain that the victims were somehow lured, one by one, to the barn. It is unknown how this was done. 2. Simon Rhinelander claimed he saw two unknown individuals at the edge of the forest near Hinterkaifeck on the 1st of April at 3am. There was a boy standing in the ditch, and about 10 meters further on, a second fellow. He was frightened and turned his head to the side, so that I could not see his face. When he heard about the murders days later, he reported this encounter to the police. The individuals were never identified. 3. On the 2nd of April, the night after the murders, a man called Michael Plaukel walked past Hinterkaifeck. He noticed that smoke was coming from the homestead's fireplace and had a revolting smell. Someone approached him with a lantern, prompting Michael to quickly leave. The police did not investigate what may have been burned in the oven. 4. Sometime in May 1927, an unknown individual stopped a resident of Weidhofen, asking questions about the murder. He then started shouting that he was the murderer before running into a nearby woods. The individual was never identified, although it is possible this was simply a hoax. Before the murders even took place, strange events occurred in Hinterkaifeck. 1. The maid quit six months before the attack. It has been reported that the reason she left was because she heard strange sounds in the homestead's attic. She believed the place was haunted and no longer wished to work there. 2. In March, not long before the murders, Andreas found a newspaper he didn't subscribe to on his property. The newspaper was from Munich, which is approximately 70 kilometers south of Hinterkaifeck. Andreas believed the postman delivered the paper to the farm by mistake. However, no other home in the area subscribed to that particular newspaper. 3. By far the most unsettling event occurred a few days before the murders. Andreas told his neighbors that he had found human tracks in the snow that led from the forest to the farm's machine room, where the lock had been broken. During the night, they heard what sounded like footsteps in the attic, but nobody could be found when they investigated. Andreas did not report either incident to the police. 4. Cassilia Gabriel's school friend reported that the girl said her mother had fled the farm the night before the attack after an argument. 
It is undetermined how many of these incidences are actually linked to the murder, although point three is by far the most compelling here. With no apparent motive, it was difficult for the police to proceed. Nonetheless, they managed to list some potential suspects, which included Victoria Gabriel's own late husband, who some claimed had not actually died during World War I. It is possible that Victoria's son, Joseph, may have been conceived through incest. She and Andreas were found to be having an incestuous relationship, and were both given a criminal charge. This could have proven to be a motive for Carl Gabriel. However, there is still no evidence that he survived the war. Lawrence Slittenbauer, who had discovered the bodies, was also a potential suspect. He was another man suspected of being the true father of Joseph, as opposed to Andreas. Not only this, but he was found to be in possession of a key to the homestead, which had gone missing days before the murders took place. When asked by Michael Powell and Jacob Sigel why he had gone into the homestead by himself when it was unknown whether the murderer was still there, he said he went to look for his son, Joseph. Lawrence also admitted to the police that he moved the bodies, covering them up out of respect. One theory for Lawrence's motive is that Victoria had demanded financial support for Joseph. Lawrence denied murdering anyone and died in 1941. Other suspects and leads were also investigated over the years, but no conclusion was ever reached by the police. However, in 2017, Bill James and Rachel McCarthy James published a book called The Man from the Train, claiming that Paul Mueller was the most likely suspect for the murders. Paul, a German migrant, was a suspect in numerous slaughters across the United States, all of which involved the murder of an entire family in an isolated home using farm tools as weapons. In each case, the bodies were moved, and no items or money were taken, just like the Hinterkaifeck murders. It is theorized in the book that Paul Mueller returned to Germany after too much attention was being drawn to his crimes. No murderer was ever convicted, and the case was officially closed in 1955, with some later interrogations taking place in 1986. The case remains officially unsolved to this day. <laughs>